Hello and welcome to our final lecture on the series on the digestive system and in part six of this series we're going to take a look at the liver. Now the liver is the largest gland in the body and if we take a look at this uh, it has a variety of functions uh, both associated with the digestive system as well as a variety of other functions within the body. Uh, the liver is involved with the processing and storage of nutrients uh, along the way, it also can be involved with detoxification of materials, so as it's processing nutrients, it has the ability to essentially go in and essentially break down or at least potentially modify uh, damaging uh, chemicals um, such as alcohol, things like that. Uh, the liver is going to have an endocrine function in that it's going to be involved with secreting a lot of factors uh, that are taken up by uh, the bloodstream. Uh, such as albumin, prothrombin, fibrinogen, and lipoproteins, uh, as well as the exocrine portion uh, of the liver, which is involved with synthesizing bile uh, to assist in the digestion of, of fats and lipids. Uh, in terms of storage of nutrients, uh, it's going to store a lot of glucose, a lot of fat, uh, as well as being a, a good location for the storage of vitamin A within the body. Now, if we take a look at uh, the structure, essentially the, the functional units within the liver, uh, the best way of taking a look at this is taking a look at the portal canal. Uh, the portal canal are specialized structures that are found throughout the liver in different little functional subunits, uh, which actually surrounds uh, essentially what's referred to as the portal triad, three structures that help delineate the different functions associated with the liver. And so if we take a look at this, uh, we've got a portal triad uh, on the image to um, the right on this slide. What we've got is a pretty clear uh, artery, a little arterial there marked with one. And this is going to be a branch of the hepatic artery. And so the hepatic artery is relatively small. Uh, it's going to carry about 25% of uh, the liver's blood supply. And it's going to be carrying oxygen-rich blood. Now it's going to run parallel to the hepatic portal vein, uh, which is illustrated with number two on our diagram uh, to the right, our, our image to the right. The hepatic portal vein and branches of the hepatic portal vein are going to carry about 75% of the blood supply to the liver. And now what we've got in with the hepatic portal vein is an example of a portal system. And so what we have in essence are two capillary beds two sets of capillaries between the heart and the return to the heart running through the system. And so oxygen rich blood but nutrient poor blood is going to go into the essentially the regions of the intestines and it's essentially going to pick up nutrients but it's going to give up its oxygen as it's passing through the intestines. That blood is going to be collected within the hepatic portal vein and so the hepatic portal vein is essentially draining from the intestines, draining oxygen-poor blood, nutrient-rich blood, and it's going to pass through the liver. And so it's going to pass through the liver, lots of nutrients, but relatively poor oxygen, which is why we need this dual blood supply um, because of the, the hepatic arteries are going to deliver the oxygen. So essentially what's going to happen is the hepatic portal vein is going to dump into the capillaries within the liver, dump it into a second capillary bed and then ultimately uh, we'll look at drainage from the liver itself. But that drainage from the liver, drainage of blood from the liver, is going to be a mixture of the blood that's delivered by the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein. Okay, so we've got that in terms of the blood supply to the liver. Number three, our third component within our portal triad, is lined by a simple cuboidal epithelium, so different than the blood vessels we've looked at in the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein. Number three is going to be a bile duct. It's going to be a simple cuboidal epithelium. It's going to be the duct system involved with carrying the bile that's produced by the hepatocytes, the liver cells, uh, and ultimately deliver that to where it can be added to the materials within the duodenum. Now, if we take a look at the liver itself, in between these uh, portal canals, uh, portal uh, triads, we're going to have the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are going to be the primary liver cells. Uh, the primary structure and functional unit within the liver. Most of the time, these hepatocytes are going to be in one or two cell-thick plates, which are going to be separated by 
essentially blood capillaries, what are referred to as hepatic sinusoids or liver sinusoids. So essentially we're going to have a layer of hepatocytes, liver cells, and then we're going to have a blood capillary, and then another layer of liver cells, and then another blood capillary, another layer of liver cells, another layer of blood capillaries. And so in essence, we're going to have a very rich capillary bed, these hepatic sinusoids, and lots of hepatocytes right up against the capillaries. They're so close to the capillaries that there's actually a discontinuous endothelial wall so that the materials from the bloodstream are going to really bathe our hepatocytes very easily. And so a lot of exchange of materials between the liver cells and the blood supply. So if we take a look at this, and this is a, a scanning electron micrograph, and so we've got a hepatocyte to the bottom left. We've got uh, the liver sinusoid, essentially the liver blood capillary, uh, with lots of openings uh, as it's passing uh, from the upper left to the bottom right. Uh, but we can say lots and lots of openings, those little kind of pores when you take a look at it. And in essence, what it gives rise to is a space between the capillary and the hepatocytes. And it's such a distinct space that it has a, a distinct name. It's a space of Dies. And the space of Dies is going to be this opening that's outside of the blood vessel. So it's going to be dealing with tissue fluid. And in essence, it's the start of the lymphatic vessels, the start of the lymphatic space. Uh, but it's open and continuous with the capillaries, open and continuous with these sinusoidal capillaries. And so we have very rapid exchange of nutrients, oxygen, secretory products, as well as potential toxins are going to be able to flow essentially unimpeded between the sinusoid, the liver capillaries, and the space of Dies, which is the beginning of the lymphatic vessels. So we got lots of exchange occurring between the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. And along the way, it's bathing the hepatocytes, the liver cells then, can interact with these materials that are in this area. Now, as these materials then are being delivered to a region of the, the liver, they're essentially being carried by either hepatic artery or what we're primarily focused on, a branch of the hepatic pole vein, it's gonna dump the blood into these liver sinusoids. The liver sinusoids are gonna allow free exchange of materials between the blood supply and the space of Dies, and within the space of Dies, the hepatocytes, the liver cells, can interact with those materials, you know, bring in nutrients, process the nutrients, store the nutrients, all of those things we've talked about. But ultimately, these liver sinusoids are going to drain into central veins. And these central veins are going to be larger structures because they're going to be collecting all of the blood from the hepatic artery branches, the hepatic portal vein branches. Uh, they're going to be draining an entire region of the kidney. And so we're going to have what starts out as a little venule with very little connective tissue around it. So the portal triad, the hepatic artery, the hepatic portal vein, has a lot of connective tissue. It has a bile duct sitting in there um, among it. The central veins are essentially just a venule surrounded by these hepatocytes, not a whole lot of structure associated with it. So that's the blood flow. We're also going to be involved or focused in on the production of bile. And bile has a lot of things that are going to be present. Bile acids, phospholipids, cholesterol, bilirubin, a uh, variety of other things. But it basically has a composition that it's like a detergent. And so like a detergent, it's going to be break, good at breaking down particles. And so it's going to basically allow us to take big globs of fat and break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller kind of clusters of fat through emulsification. In addition to these factors associated with the detergent-like properties, we're also going to have metabolic wastes and byproducts of red blood cell destruction. Now, all of these things could be potentially harmful if it got into our bloodstream. And so while many of the materials interacting with the bloodstream are going to be out along the side with the space of Dies and our liver sinusoids, bile is going to be produced and then dumped into a biocanaliculus. Biocanaliculus is essentially almost like a a membrane fusion between neighboring um, hepatocytes, neighboring liver cells. So we've got these small tubular plasma membrane bound tubes, in essence, or gaps between adjacent hepatocytes, which is going to drain into a bile duct to, again, keep the bile separate from uh, the bloodstream and the tissue fluids. So we've got lots of hepatocytes and primary cells within the liver. 
We're also going to have a second category of cell, a rarer population of cell, but we're going to have phagocytic cells that are going to be lining these liver sinusoids called Kupfer cells. And again, these are important because we've got lots of materials that are going to be passing through the liver. Lots of blood supply, we're carrying things from our digestive system. And so if something got into the digestive system, a possible disease-causing pathogen, we want to be able to capture that and deal with that as early as possible. And so we're going to have these phagocytic cells, these Kupfer cells, within the liver that are able to go through and essentially gobble up uh, foreign debris, foreign material, pathogenic uh, things. Now, the Kupfer cells, like uh, phagocytes, like macrophages we've seen in other regions of the body, are often difficult to identify. But in this case, uh, we can take a look at them because they're going to phagocytize things like ink particles, like tripan blue. Uh, so if we take a look at this slide, uh, the image on the right-hand side, we've got the reddish hepatocytes, uh, and you can see kind of a kind of grayish appearance, uh, cells kind of scattered around one towards um, kind of the central region above the central vein. Uh, we got another one that's to the right of the central vein, uh, just over gradually, and then a couple of kind of below the central vein. They, again, are going to be phagocytic cells, kind of larger cells, but we can identify them based on the materials within their cytoplasm. If we take a look at the organization of the liver, what we're going to see is essentially kind of a, a network of hepatocytes and blood vessels and bile ducts that are scattered throughout the entire structure of it, but we can characterize or essentially subdivide it in a variety of ways. We can divide this as uh, a classic liver lobule based on blood flow. We can classify it or organize it as a portal liver lobule, and a portal liver, liver lobule is based on bile flow, or we can take a look at it in a hepatic acinus arapopore, which is looking at a liver pathology. And so the classic liver lobules are the kind of large orange hexagon, the porter liver lobules are the green triangles, and the hepatic acinus of rapopore are these kind of reddish um, diamond-shaped structures. Now the classic liver lobule is based on the direction of blood flow. And the idea with this is that we're going to have a relatively hexagonal structure that's going to be repeated across the structure of the liver, but at the periphery, at each of the points of the hexagon, we're going to have a portal triad with its portal canal. It's going to be dumping the materials into the sinusoid, so the hepatic artery, hepatic portal vein. We're going to dump the materials into the liver sinusoids, and it's going to drain through the liver sinusoids into that central vein. And so this central vein is going to be the center of these structures. And that is, is one way of looking at it. But again, another way of looking at it, the same cells, the same overall uh, organization, across the entire liver can be looked at in terms of bile flow. And with bile flow, we're going to have the portal liver lobules, which are going to be a triangular shape. And so instead of the central veins as the central point, we're going to be looking at the central veins at the periphery and essentially drawing a line to connect them. We're going to have a triangular structure and in essence at the center is going to be a portal canal. And most importantly, for the portal liver lobule, where we're looking at bile flow, that central hepatic bile duct is going to be the center of the portal triad, the center of the structure, so it's going to be the center of the portal uh, liver lobule. So you're basically looking at a roughly uh, triangular-shaped structure draining into our bile duct. Well, finally, we've got the hepatic acinus of rapopore. This is based on liver pathology. This is a diamond-shaped structure. Uh, with portal triads at one end, central veins at the other axis, and it's looking at the idea that blood is going to be released by these uh, cells within the portal canals, and if it has a toxin, the highest level of the toxin is going to be exposed to the cells closest, further away it's going to have the lowest level, and so this can be used to explain liver pathologies. And then finally, we'll take a look at the gallbladder as a structure associated with the liver involved with storage and concentrating the bile. Uh, it's going to release the bile in response to CCK, the cholecystokinin uh, that we said uh, was regulating the release of digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Again, a similar mechanism for the control of release of things from the gallbladder. This finishes up our lecture series on the digestive system. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.